no oh, if, oh, it, the question for those y'all following along home, uh, he's asking absolute advantage. Is it the person that's getting the most money, the work, person working the fastest, the person who's giving up the least? It's the person giving up the least. That's the absolute advantage. Yeah, it doesn't matter about the money. What was it? Yeah, the person with the easy decision. When Kathy, you know, she was faster than anybody. She's going to make more money than anybody, but she did not have the absolute advantage because she had the harder decision. Am I going to be a plumber or an accountant? Where the other two is pretty clear cut what it is that they need to do. Kind of thing. Um, Seem like we, you asked that question um, two seconds before I was ready for you to ask that question. Uh, oh well, yes. Yeah, Sunday we Monday we went to the equestrian thing trying to find a horse. I mean, that saddle. No luck. This weekend was pretty much. This was it. Okay, so we and we were talking the other day. We sort of. Pulled a whole bunch of threads together, pulled a whole bunch of parallels between you and me doing business with our local gas station. And gee, these people on these neighboring islands out there in the Pacific Ocean, and we related it all to ultimately the international trade. Pulled a whole bunch together because it all works the same way. Whether it's you doing business with the gas station or UPS doing business with Toyota, it still is business being conducted, so it's sort of the same kind of rules apply. And we talked it, so that's why I merged two or three chapters together. Because what's, th this part of chapter two is actually like chapter 17 or something like that. But ultimately, when we do the trading, when we do business with other people, when we do business with other company, countries, we ended the end results is we get lower prices, we get more variety to choose from, more numerically of each item. We get more Lestara that we can enjoy. Hi, Lestara, how are you? Yes. Uh, do we get an easier work situation? We get world peace, we're more efficient and we're better for the environment because we're doing things where things do best, not trying to do things where things don't want to be done. We're not trying to grow oranges in Alaska, right? We're not trying to make popsicles in Florida. I guess you could do that with refrigerators. But yeah, it's better for the environment, it's easier, more efficient. There's a whole lot to like when it comes to trade. And that's where we were last Thursday. So we all happy with that. Y'all leave class last Thursday saying, woohoo, trade for the win. I love me to trade. Something like that. Huh? Something like that. Yeah, Luke's like, I don't know, I went here. We know, we talked about you. <laughs> Not a whole lot, but just a little bit. Um, but mostly, trade has a lot of beautiful things there. But there are a couple of speed bumps along the way. Care to take a guess? Taxes. Taxes? No. Huh? Regulations. Well, you have regulations anyway. The big ugly here is the loss of jobs. Because we're, we don't need sock makers here in the United States making socks anymore because our socks are being made in China or Vietnam or Korea, something like that. So we lose jobs. Going back to the, our little island friend situation that we had before, we went from having was two, two of our castaways were working on the banana trees, two of them were working on the coconut trees, but then once we went all in with bananas, we really probably only needed three people working at bananas, so then we had, so maybe one of those, the new worker on a banana field was one of the two that was raising coconuts, so what happened to the other one? Out of work. All right. Now, when you're stranded on a desert island looking for a way home, yeah, it's okay to free up the labor to be finding, so you got somebody else to help build a boat to get us out of here, right? But if it's like, I need a paycheck, that's a problem. And we see, <coughs> especially in South Side Virginia, we see a, a crap ton of this. What has happened to, y'all are too young now to remember, congratulations and enjoy. 10 years ago, the, 15 years ago, the economy around here was doing a lot better. We had a whole lot going on here, but a lot of people making good money, doing good jobs, making clothing, 
making furniture, this kind of stuff. Manufacturing wages were somebody that graduated, let's say they graduated, you know, toward the bottom half of the class in your high school, you know, those people, and they're turning around making, getting a job when they're making $15, $20 an hour. Not bad, right? For, you know, some of those people that graduated last in class in high school, right? So, I'm not saying that, they, but, uh, but what ended up happening is now those jobs have gone away. Our clothes are being made not in the United States. A lot of our furniture is not being made in the United States. Generally, when it comes to furniture, they'll make the tabletops here in the United States, but the legs and all that kind of stuff, the legs and feet and all that kind of stuff, they turn on legs somewhere else on the other side of the planet. But just as far as a flat tabletop warping and all that kind of stuff, real tabletops, wooden tabletops, they're not gonna, we're not gonna be shipping them over. But a lot of the, the furniture companies around here, you go and you look at the real furniture, you know, the tabletop here, the rest of it made somewhere else. So we have lost a bunch of jobs. So we have lost a bunch of jobs around here. So you had these people that are used to making $20 an hour every day, can't make $20 an hour because there's no more furniture jobs around here. Well, what are they going to do? Well, I can't program a computer so I can work at McDonald's for seven and a quarter. And then, right. So there's issues there. So then a lot of people end up doing what? moving away to where the jobs are, where they can find some jobs because there's not a whole lot of left to choose from here. So our population around here is only maybe like two thirds of what it was 15 years ago. And where I'm at, where I live, out there in Martinsville, in Danville, those areas, they just, they flat out got brutalized. The nation went through their recession that we'll talk about later. They hit a recession in 2008, we hit it in like 2001 year 2000 we've been in it all the whole time we are the county that i go to technically i live in it went from five high schools to three high schools that's how much our population shrunk and in three high schools aren't that full our population has shrunk that much because the people can't stay because they, they, they can't find jobs but then you know, so ha half the people there, you either work for the hospital, work for the school system, or you work for the businesses that are taking care of the people that work for the hospital or work for the school system, right? The restaurants that are feeding the teachers and the doctors and the, that kind of stuff. Ain't a whole lot going on. And so the unemployment rate, even now, is the highest in the state in Marksville and Danville. And that's just three counties west of where y'all are. I'd like to say that's where I'm living. And here, we ain't much better. We'll talk more about that, specifically the unemployment numbers when we get to the later chapter. But the number one thing is the loss of jobs. And that's the thing that really is getting Donald Trump and getting really all getting his first standing up about the the trade war stuff that he's been talking about the last few months, doing the tariffs to try to make farm products more expensive. So comparatively, the American products won't seem to be that much more expensive than a foreign made one. So maybe we'll be okay with, well, I'll buy American and I'll help American create American jobs. So that's what he's trying to do because he's trying to stop all the job loss that's going on here. And there is no disputing, we do lose jobs because of this. And we generally, if trade isn't fair, we'll lose money. Money is leaving the country if the trade isn't balanced. And in most cases for the United States, the people that we trade with, it isn't balanced. Did I talk about trading with your brother, younger brother, yeah. you know, a week ago by you, you Spider-Man comic book and Batman comic book or whatever it was kind of thing? Well, what happens if, you know, he's all the time wanting your expensive comic books and all he's offering is cheap comic books in return? Like, I'll take a cheap comic book, you got to give me some money, right? So he's getting a lot more comic book than you are, you're getting money out of it. So slowly but surely, he's going to be losing his money, right? For us... That's kind of what's happening. Ideally, you give me a comic book, I give you a comic book of equal value. No money really needs to be involved. Everything's equal, everything's fair, and we're all happy. No harm, no foul. You buy a million dollars worth of our stuff, I buy, we buy a million dollars of your stuff. So yeah, we lose a million dollars worth of jobs for stuff that we ain't making, but then we gain a million dollars worth of jobs for the stuff that we're selling to you. So guess what? It's supposed to be about a break even, right? Yeah, there might be a little job loss as we get more efficient, but that's sort of the plan there. But what's been happening is 
We buy more of their stuff than they buy of us. We're buying their cars, their clothes, their stuff, and they buy a few of our chainsaws and a few of our Ford F-150s. And so then in order to keep getting the other stuff, we have money leaving the country. Why is that a problem? Well, is that a problem? Okay, why? Yes, less money right here, and why is that a problem? Why you is that a problem? You can't pay people for their jobs. Well, if you don't have money, you can't buy their stuff. Yeah. You're getting there, but it, but there's a basic thing that I was seeing if somebody could pull out there. What happens to something if there's less of it? What happens to value of something if there's less of it? It goes up. Like, what makes Spider-Man comic book number one so expensive, so valuable? Because there's very few of them out there. What makes a 1964 and a half Mustang convertible so expensive? You're talking to what, a 50-year-old, 50 50-some-odd-year-old 50 car, but why is it so expensive? Because there ain't many of them out there, right? So we have less or something, the few that are remaining are generally going to increase in value. Well, what happens? So what does it mean to increase in value? You have to give more in order to get it, right? You have to give a lot in order to get a Mustang, a 64 Mustang. You have to give a lot to get that Spider-Man comic book number one. You don't have to give a whole lot to get Spider-Man number 3,812 or whatever number it is that's on the store shelf right now, right? Because there's a ton of the things out there. I have no clue. I don't do comic books. So what happens if you have less money? Money is a tool. There's less pictures of green pieces of paper with pictures of presidents on it. Each of those increases in value. It's harder to get a dollar. Each, well, each dollar is worth more because there's fewer of them out there. So what do you got to do? You've got to give up even more to get a dollar, which means you got to work harder, which means those dollars are valuable. You're not getting pay raises. Prices are going up because these dollars aren't, uh, these dollars are holding value. You end up getting other issues there. Actually, prices go down in that case, but you got to work harder to get the dollars because I'm not good at you. Hey, I got this. Whether it's a phone, whether it's a comic book, whether it's a picture of George Washington, the more valuable it is, the more I got to get out of you. Your wages are not going to be going up because you're trying to be getting, I'm not giving you pay raise because you're asking me more of something that is more valuable than it was yesterday. You see that? And so suddenly that gets to the, well, you and I aren't bringing home that much cash. So then where do we get the money to spend stuff? And then that gets into the recession, all that kind of stuff that y'all get into, maybe the loss of jobs. We don't have as much money because our bosses aren't paying a whole lot because money is valuable. So we ain't buying as much. We're not buying as much. Companies don't need to make as much. Maybe they get rid of more workers. Third issue is why are you depending on somebody else? Because we're trading. All of the American TV companies, I used this example the other day, they one by one stopped making TVs. Now, if you want a TV, you're buying it from a company based out of Japan or South Korea. That's pretty much it. LG, Sharp, Samsung, Sony, Vizio. I thought, you know, Sharp, I thought I said them, but okay, Sharp. So what happens if we go to war against South Korea and Japan, <laughs> no more TVs, right? We're depending on somebody else. We're trusting them to make what it is that we need. What if instead of tomatoes, it was, um, instead of TVs, it was tomatoes, right? Did I go give that example the other day? The whole, uh, you know, if we go to war with, if, you know, we'll let Mexico do what they do best. The tomatoes grow better in Mexico than they do here in the United States. So the, all the tomatoes are getting grown there. We don't grow them here anymore. Well, if we go to war against, against Mexico, we don't have tomatoes anymore, right? Or if they do something wrong, they do something sideways, they don't manage things, whatever, so they have water shortage. We could have grown them, but we didn't. We were trusting them to do it, and they didn't get it done. So how big of an issue is that? Well, it depends on how important whatever the products are. 
Are you okay with trusting? Well, okay, if we don't get tomatoes, well, we can always, I don't know, put cucumbers on our hamburgers. I don't know. What else can you put on a hamburger in place of a tomato? What else can you use instead of the There's the threat to national security question. If we're letting, we're buying stuff from them, we're let, they're, we're buying their stuff instead of making it ourselves. Well, maybe, you know, we're buying the computer chips that they make instead of making them ourselves. Well, we're taking these computer chips that we bought from them, from Samsung. The new whatever air fighter jet that Boeing is gonna make, they're getting the computer chips from Samsung. Well, there's some new Exynos processors to go into jets. Well, what if Samsung put these little backdoor codes in those processor chips so that the one day that we end up going to war against South Korea, well, Samsung can say, ha, 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 we'll teach those Americans in any type of command, whatever, all those processor chips to shut down and planes drop like rocks. Could it happen? Yeah. It could. Yeah. We're trusting them to do that. Or, okay, if we go to war against Mexico, we don't have tomatoes anymore, so tomatoes are a good source of vitamin C. Maybe our soldiers are going to die of scurvy because they're not going to have the vitamin C that they need while they're fighting. Right. Here, here. Hmm? We win the war against Mexico, but we all starve to death. So. Yes. Yes, pure victory. Yes. Um, but just, I mean, there, there's potential consequences here. Yeah, I'm purposely going to the extreme with some of these examples there, but yeah, there it is. Or the, maybe you see, okay, maybe they don't hack them. Maybe they didn't put a back door in there, but Samsung is going to have an idea about what we're doing with our airplanes if we're using their chips. They'd be saying, okay, they want, such, they want processors that have such and such a capability. Well, apparently those airplanes are going to have such and such a capability, right? They're going to know things. And are we okay trusting them? Okay, maybe it's as innocent as you know, the, the whatever, the... You know, the basement of the White House, the Situation Room, when they're sitting there battling war, you know, they got all these big screens on the wall. What if those are Samsung TVs? They all had a little microphone embedded in them and we're at war against South Korea. They're sitting there listening to us, right, to our TVs. It could happen. Okay, so. So there are some negatives. The loss of money, well, that actually comes with some good. It comes with some bad. It, 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 the loss of jobs is the big ugly. So the question is, are we okay with the job loss in order to get all of this? This is beautiful. The gains that we get from trade is beautiful. We love it, but we know that some people are going to get lost along the way. Are we okay with that? Can we live with that? Are we going to do anything about it? Are we going to say, well, tough cookies? You know, yeah, you are a highly skilled furniture maker. You can run a lathe with your eyes closed. We know because we've seen you do it. Hey, you're awesome at the job, but now we want you to be flipping burgers for seven and a quarter an hour and like it. Are we okay with that? Are we going to do things to try to help these people? Um, that's part of what our government is there for, one of the roles. roles. Roles of the government is to be helping smooth out speed bumps like this. We had a thing back in 2000, 2001, when we, when the, the, this shift really started happening about losing the textile and furniture companies. They had this thing called the Trade Act, where if you lost your job because of foreign trade, when, especially when NAFTA went into effect, and your plant got shut down, and it was because of NAFTA or whatever. The Virginia state government had a deal with you that they, you could go to community college free for two years and you could stay on unemployment, collecting unemployment benefits for the two years. So, yeah, you ain't getting rich living on your unemployment check. That's barely going to cover your bills, but we're going to cover your bills and give you free education to get educated into doing something else. We'll take care of you for those two years so you can retool yourself to go do something else because. You got shafted because we, the government, made this agreement with Mexico and Canada. So we had a trade act. So then every couple of weeks, I had a bunch of students coming up to me with these yellow forms. I had a sign saying, yeah, they were in class. Yeah, they were in class. They utterly ruined my signature. It just became a scrawl. I mean, I'd leave out letters in my own name, which is why I signed my name now. But 
that's a beautiful thing that we have in place. Uh, a lot of the federal financial aid, some of y'all are doing part of that is because we need to be retraining people for the future because our economy 10 years from now, 20 years from now, it's going to be different because it has to be different because as transportation keeps improving, the ability to be doing foreign trade, foreign exchange is just going to get easier and easier and easier. So the ability to take advantage of these other com other countries, other companies in other countries that have the competitive advantage, yeah, that's it for cheap, plentiful labor. That's just going to get easier and easier and easier. So we need to be getting into another game. So then we talked about that the other day. You need to try to find a job that um, is something that's not easily transferable. You know, some kind of service job. Healthcare. We talk about that. Teaching, yeah, they can, somebody can be your teacher remotely instead of me standing in front of you. Somebody can be being in, you can be watching a talking head on the TV. You can get teaching done overseas. So my job potentially could be in jeopardy as internet connections improve throughout the world. How about a nurse or a doctor? There's always gonna be local jobs for those. That's why those jobs, those careers are booming. You want, you want job security for the long haul? Go into something medical field or technology field, building the computers that those remote teachers are gonna be using, right? Setting up the networks that are gonna be beaming in the whatever the teachers and whatever that is going on there. Technology, healthcare, that's the future. If you want job security. Go with me? Okay, so that was your moment of inspiration, inspirational speech there. So, if I would have asked the first day of class and I didn't, Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. What, what do you think of when you hear the words economics? I generally get two answers. Money and supply and demand. And I say, okay, what supply and demand mean? And I get, I don't know, I've just heard it. Does that sound like any of y'all? Not that I'm in mid no, Preston, thank you for admitting. Sure, okay. Why not this person in here? Okay, uh, so we're supply and demand, this is sort of the meat and potatoes of this class this subject everything sort of rolls back to supply and demand it's an interesting way to think about things so that's where we're going today but we're going to start with the idea of maximizing behavior what does it mean to maximize something full potential i'll buy that who you said bigger it's not just bigger what's beyond bigger biggest Biggest, getting it as big as you can, Make, taking it to its full potential. Yes. When you hit that maximize button on your computer screen, what happens? Whatever that window is, takes up your entire screen. Ain't nothing left, right? That's what we're talking about. Getting the most that we can is what we're shooting for here. And we have behaviors where, and this generalized, keep it simple, it's a generalizing stereotyping, and some of y'all are like, well, yeah. You know, my religion won't let me believe that. My values won't. It, 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 I know it's more complicated than that, but in the nutshell, for individuals, consumers, I'm going to call us consumers, not in, but people that are buying and using stuff, our behavior is to maximize our utility. Utility is usefulness, enjoyment, satisfaction. We want to get the most enjoyment we can with our limited resources. We ain't got much money, we ain't got much time, but we want to get the most happiness that we can out of our time here. That's kind of the thinking. I know some of y'all may be here for a higher purpose than that, but we'll just sort of set that one aside. But the higher calling that you might have is part of the satisfaction that you get from your time here, right? So, still work. We want to get the most enjoyment, satisfaction, usefulness that we can out of our time, out of our money, out of our intelligence, out of our strength out of our, bless you, out of our iPhone, whatever it is that we have. So, if we want to get the most enjoyment that we can, Loveline hasn't eaten anything yet today, and she walks down to the snack machine and she looks at that pack of M&Ms, plain to peanut. Plain m &Ms. she looks at a pack of plain m &Ms, or she looks down here at the bottom shelf of that machine where there's a zero bar. You know, the zero bar is still covered with dust because it's been in there for a couple of years. You know. So she's going to be looking at that zero bar and that pack of m &Ms. Both are a dollar. Which is she going to buy? She can buy the m because she could get more enjoyment out of it than she is that zero bar. 
Have any of you ever had a zero bar? It's like white chocolate on the outside. I'm not completely sure what all's on the inside. I like me some white chocolate, but I still can't quite reconcile myself to what it is. But anyway, I, I, I dare you to eat a zero bar this weekend. That's, there you go. I dare you. They're pretty good. I mean, they are pretty good. I like okay. zeros. Okay, cool. A couple of y'all. The rest of you, make it happen. That's your homework assignment there. I was going to get the one from here, though. Yeah, maybe not. If it's covered with dust, let it go. All right. Um, but otherwise, you know, just you know, check the label on it before you eat. Bye. There you go. She's gonna. She, it, okay. Um, Lovely. The reason why she said the plain M and M's is because I'm sorry, but she's allergic to peanuts. I wasn't supposed to tell anybody, but I really need to for this. She's allergic to peanuts. Of course, I'm about ready to get sued for putting her personal information out here on the internet now. But she's allergic to peanuts. They got peanut M&M's. They say M&M right on the bag. But you can enjoy eating a bag of peanut M&M's. <laughs> like having your head swelling up like a helium balloon. And throwing up for three days straight. No. So, how much would you be willing to pay for that experience? Zero. Absolutely nothing. She ain't gonna want to spend her limited money her eating something that's gonna make her sick. That might kill her, right? When she's got the next thing over, she's got M&Ms that are just like plain M&Ms that are just like so fantabulously just, oh, right? So she could just have a wonderful woohoo kind of experience or she could swell up like a helium balloon for the same cost, right? She's going to buy the things that are going to give her the most enjoyment. And of course, as we talked about last time, our enjoyment is going to change. If she's already eaten five packs of plain M&Ms already today. The amount of enjoyment she might get out of six pack, well, maybe she might get more enjoyment out of that zero bar. So maybe she'll eat the zero bar before the six pack of plain M&Ms, but she's going to eat the zero bar before she eats the peanut M&Ms, right? But she's going to be making the decisions that's going to give her the most happiness, the most satisfaction, the most enjoyment, given her current circumstances. If you win lottery, what are you going to do? However many M&Ms you want, whatever you want, right? You're just going to have a truck full of M&M's showing up at your house every week. That's one of my dreams in life, winning the lottery, is I'm going to go pay some money. I'm going to rent a Krispy Kreme store for the day. And I'm going to, they're going to have a conveyor belt. You know, all the, the beautiful donuts, they come out of the thing, they end up on the conveyor belt, whatever. And I'm going to slide the thing off at the end of it. I'm going to lay it out. I'm going to get down on my knees with my head tilted up, my mouth open, just looking at me some soft gray skin. That is my dream. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some extremely non-limited resources that I don't have. That's my dream. For businesses, what is a business there for? Profit. To make the most profit possible because what is a business? Why does a business exist? To make money. To make money for who? The owners. And who are the owners? They are also consumers. I'm running my own business instead of working in Burger King because I think I can make more money doing it myself than I can working in Burger King. And I want that extra money so I can get more stuff to get more enjoyment out of my time here on a planet. So I can live in a big house instead of a small house. So I can drive a nice car instead of a not so nice car. So I can eat M&Ms instead of zero bars, right? So the business is a machine it is a tool that people use to get them more money in order to get themselves more satisfaction. So that's the drive for why businesses are pushing all the time. We need profit. We need profit. Because if we ain't doing profit, we're just making a paycheck. And we could have been making a paycheck working for somebody else and had a whole lot less stress. I... I told y'all I built house, work helped build houses when I was in college, y'all's age. And there's a guy that I was working with. Have any of y'all ever seen the TV show Bonanza? You know Hoss from Bonanza? Big, goofy looking the guy. Well intentioned, but not the brightest ball that walks. This guy that I work with, Daniel. If you picture Hoss, then you picture Daniel. Daniel's missing a couple fingers like this in the table saw accident. And then he lost the end of his thumb a few years later doing the exact same thing. 
Uh, sometime, if our schedule will allow us, we'll spend 20 minutes. I'll tell you some Daniel stories. And if nothing else, that's going to be your scared straight moment for why you need to stay in school, because otherwise you'd be working with people like Daniel. But one of the things, well, if it, love Daniel to death, great guy, nice guy and all that stuff. And something I was trying to hammer, we're building houses Monday through Friday, whatever time in the morning until 5, 5, whenever we could get out. But then he would take these little side jobs. Building a deck for somebody, putting shingles on a roof for somebody, building a cabinet, whatever, doing these, these side jobs on the evenings and the weekends. But he wasn't that good at figuring out the money, the time, all that kind of stuff. So when the dust settles, I was sitting down with Daniel one day, and I'm like, okay, you really, you know, half of the jobs that you do, you make money on, but then half of them, you lose money on. So when the dust settles, all you're really doing, if you math it out, is you're making wages, the same money that you would be making if you just kept working on the day job. You're giving up all this extra time with your family, all the extra time that you could be doing other stuff, but instead, all you're doing is you're putting all this extra stress on yourself, all the extra hours, and you basically, when the dust settles, you're just making more wages, not even time and a half because you're just paying yourself a regular wage. You either need to charge more, you need to get your figure done better, or you need to rethink what it is you're doing. He didn't, he didn't rethink what he's doing, but now he's working for one of his brothers because they ended up burning down a historical home, but that's another subject in another thing. So, businesses, the point is, if you just could be making, if you just can be making the same wages that he could have working for his father, well, he should just keep working for his father. And then he wouldn't have the stress in the long hours, right? If you could be a farmer raising soybeans and make the same money that you could get working at McDonald's, you work at McDonald's because it's a whole lot less stress. Because you're, you know, okay, at McDonald's, I go in and I work and I get my seven and a quarter an hour. You ain't sitting there worried about, okay, they're calling for a thunderstorm as my paycheck for the year about to get screwed over. You know, tornado season's coming through, and you like have an oh crap kind of moment for all that time. Hurricane's coming through, and you like oh crap for a few days. You don't have that when you're working at McDonald's, all right? Or somebody's goats are coming from the next field over and coming over to you. You don't have that problem when you're working at McDonald's. So if you're going to average out the money that you're making on farm, and it's going to be seven and a quarter an hour, maybe you need to quit the farm and then go do them else if you can make more. Then your next best alternative, opportunity cost is what I'm getting to. If you can make more than the next best alternative, you do more. But it just, if you can put up with the extra stress of running your own business, it better be because it's going to pay you more. Right? So businesses need to make profit. They need to keep going because the reason you're doing the business is to make your life better. You can lose money for a little while, but... Only a little while. So, consumers, businesses, what's the government there to make the most of? The government. Taxes. Taxes. Uh, seems like it, but not, not necessarily. Trade. Trade, not necessarily. Anger, maybe. Frustration. Employment, I mean. Why do we have a government? Come on. <laughs> I love you, government. The point of government is to maximize the well-being of society. They got to sit there and they say, well, if we relax the trade rules, everybody's going to get cheaper socks, but 50 people are going to lose their jobs. Is the overall benefit to everybody, all 250 million Americans that are going to get a benefit from cheaper socks, worth the damage that's going to have these 50 people that are about to lose their jobs? If the answer is yes, they make it happen. If the answer is no, they don't. That's what they do. When they decide, well, we're going to raise interest rates by a quarter of a point, the reason why we're raising interest rates is because it's going to benefit these people, these people, these people, but it's going to hurt these people and these people. And which is more important, the gains for the sum, the loss to the others. And so they have to weigh these, and that's why we have the government in the first place. That's their job, is to be pulling together those things because we can't do it all ourselves. And so we're pulling our resources together, and we're 
you and I, that's what we're doing. We're pulling our resources together and putting our money together because we can't build our own roads and teach our own kids and defend our own property and also go have a job and make money. We can't do it all at the same time, right? So what do we do? We pull our money together and we take $50,000 and a gun and we hand it to Matthew and say, protect our houses for us. We hired a cop. We pull uh, $30,000 and a gun and we hand it to Jenny and say, go teach our kids, right? So then, so we, by doing that, well, okay, our kids are taken care of, so I don't have to be sitting home trying to teach them. I don't have to be sitting on a front porch with a shotgun, so then that's freeing me up to where, okay, we're going to pay Luke, not a whole lot of money, but we're going to pay Luke some money to be growing our soybeans and some cows and whatever for us. So we don't have to do it, so then I can concentrate on doing what it is that I can do best, my comparative advantage to make more money. And so what we do is instead of us working it out and I'm like, well, eeny, meeny, miny, well, Matthew, you're going to be the cop. But Sam is over there going, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, Haley, you're supposed to be the cop. So instead, what we do is we pool together, we hire these people, politicians, our government, to we hire them, we give them our, some of our money, and we say, go find the best person you can find to teach our kids. Go find the best person you can for protecting our houses. That's the point of government. And so they're the ones making those decisions and then they realize, okay, if we hire Matthew, well, yeah, Haley may not get the job, sorry. But they've got to make those decisions well, what they're going to spend the money on. They may say, well, okay, which is more important, having a teacher for the kids or having a fire department? We only have a limited amount of money and we can only have one or the other. We got to make a tough call, right? That's what we hire them for. And they need to, they're supposed to be looking out for the overall benefit of society, knowing that some people are going to gain, some people are going to lose by every decision that they make. But that's what they're supposed to do. How good of a job did they do? And so which side of that argument you're on? Whether you're the one that lost or the one that gained. Yes. So moving right along. Oh, come on, board. It's this stupid little thing here. So, we have a government, we do business with one another for just what I talk about because we can't do it all ourselves. How many of you can teach your kids physics? Preston can, Sam can, score, excellent. I can't teach my kids physics, but I can build an atomic bomb. I know, I, I, I have the understanding on how to do it. It's actually relatively straightforward, it's just you just gotta get the plutonium and minor little, anyway. It's just about critical mass. You get so many. It, it, and I'm, gonna tell us something. I'm not, I'm not going to go, but it, it, it's, the principle is relatively simple. The hard part is getting purified through Tony and you need in order to do it. But then you end up giving so many electrons in so small a space. It's like filling up a balloon. You keep blowing air and what's going to happen. Okay. It's going to pop because you got too much air in too small of a space. That's more or less what you're doing with an atomic bomb. But anyway, I digress. So you're like, oh, snap. That scale's full. He don't know what to do with the goat, but he can build an atomic bomb. Oh, right. oh that's good. Yeah. Okay. We can't do it all ourselves. We, can't, we don't have all the knowledge and expertise and time that we can do. We teach our kids physics, teach our kids math, protecting our front yards, having a nuclear missile in our backyard while we're working on our tank, growing our food, milking our chickens, getting the eggs from the goat. We, uh, we, you, we can't do it all. So we kind of have to do that specialization and trade. Otherwise, then you just got what little that you can do on your own. How many of you can sew? Can sew. Okay, congratulations. The rest of y'all be walking around naked. How many of you can milk a cow? Okay, two of you. Congratulations. The rest of you can have brittle bones and not eating cereal in the morning, right? That's the way things go. If we figure out what it is that we can do and do what we can do. We can do that specialized and then trading and we can have much richer lives than if we're just trying to go it alone. Because we have a limited amount of time, energy, money, resources to do it all ourselves. And the government's simply a tool that we use to help us to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Would you trust a government that is going to give Jenny $30,000 a gun and your children? No. no. Okay, $30,000. No gun in your children? That's yeah. probably even scarier. Just, anyway. 
Well, you're not doing middle school, so you might be okay going to another <laughs> art. So. Okay. So, a market is any place where buyers and sellers meet. Local produce market, farmer's market, Walmart. Walmart, Food Lion, Amazon, where buyers and sellers meet. Do business. Hmm? Yeah, they meet electronically. You know, whatever street corner on a Friday night, wherever this loot gets the drugs from. You know. But here I'm introducing the words demanders and suppliers. The demanders or the buyers. What the? It, demanders are your buyers. I'm introducing demand and supply here. Instead of talking buyers and sellers, I'm talking demanders and suppliers because that's how we get the demand and supply. But does demand seem a little bit strong? Yeah, well, I'm a buyer of M&Ms or I'm a demander of M&Ms. Well, we kind of, we want what we want when we want it, right? Y'all go home this afternoon, you pull oh, you, Y'all go out in the parking lot here for a few minutes and you pull out your cell phone and you don't have any service? People, okay. You can be kind of hot under the collar, right? You go home and you turn on the TV and it's nothing but a bunch of static. You're angry. Oh, you go home and you flip on a light switch and nothing happens. You're pretty hot, right? You're, getting out, you're trying to get on that phone and if you can make a phone call and you're trying to call somebody and complain. You can learn, I don't want what I want when I want it. We're pretty ill in a hurry when we don't get what it is that we expect to get. How you feel when you go into the grocery store and you look at something and they ain't got it? You go into McDonald's, you say, I'd like a Big Mac, and they say, sorry, we don't have any more. What do y'all say? Well, in people's fast food, they don't have any machines of bread. Yes. Oh, no, no, I'm not even going to go there. But yeah, but the demanders, it's kind of what we are. You know, we want what we want. Darn it. Especially when we're already paying for a service like cell service or electricity, we're already paying for that service. So if you're not giving it to us, we're paying for it. Yeah, yeah. Especially, good point, Bobby. But yeah, not the other name I was giving you, Bobby. But good point, Bobby. <laughs> it's especially when we're not when we're already paid for a service, we're not getting what we've already paid for. But we still, you know, you go walking in McDonald's and you say, "I want a Big Mac," and they say, "No, we don't have it." You know. Um. You, you go, like last night, you want to watch a Virginia Tech football game, and you pick up the remote, and you're flipping through channels, because you don't have whatever that channel is, you're a little bit irate. You go to the grocery store because you got to buy milk for your kids, and there's no milk. No, you still are, you're still are mad. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so demanders, even if we haven't paid for it yet, we want to pay for it, we kind of demand what it is we demand. We want what we want when we want it. Turn it. And the sellers, well, they're the suppliers that are going to be supplying what it is that we demand. That is going to kill me. Oh, my God, I don't know why that thing is doing that thing. Oops. I don't know what this is. Now. Right there. This is a temporary computer for those of you following along at home. The other one broke. Wasn't my fault, I promise. Maybe. But where is the market? Anywhere where the exchange is taking place. That street corner where Luke is buying his drugs from, Walmart, Amazon, wherever it happens to be. The snack machine down the hallway where Loveline's gonna be getting her MMs here in 20 minutes. And she will be getting them. Trying my Jedi powers. She will be. You know, she nod her head. So yes. <laughs> All right, wherever the exchange takes place. And in most cases, the transaction is going to involve dollars for the goods and services. But the money is just a tool. Because let's go back to was it Ashley and Barry. If there was no money there, Ashley says, I need my taxes done. And Barry says, okay, I need my sink done. You fix our sink, I'll do your taxes for you. Boom. They shake hands, done and done. But what about next year? Ashley comes up and says, I need my taxes done. Barry says, but my sink is fine. Oh crap, what's she supposed to do? She's like, okay, well, what is it you need? And he's like, well, I'd like some steak. And she, okay, so then she goes, she goes to uh, 
Allison and say, Allison, you you I, you got cows, you got steak. Do you have some steak? Yeah. Well, does your sink broken? Allison's like, no. But then Allison is like, but um, I could use, I don't know. What, what could you use? A fifth of liquor. You go, girl. She's like, I could use a fifth of liquor. So then, okay, uh, go to uh, hunt down Tyler. Tyler, right? Uh, so then she's got to hunt down Tyler. It's like, Tyler, I know you got a fifth of liquor. How's your sink? And Tyler's like, well, now that you mentioned it, my sink is kind of jacked. Score. Okay, I'll fix your sink. You give me the liquor. So then she hunts down Allison. Okay, here's your liquor. Give me the steak. Then she takes the steak. She hunts down Barry. Here's your steak. Can you fix the sink? I mean, can you do my taxes? <laughs> right? There's an episode of MASH that goes through those things where Hawkeye has a hole in his boot and he's trying to get the, this and that and whatever to get things to go along. But it doesn't end up happening because Klinger can't go on this two-day pass. And anyway, so anyway, just how big of a pain in the butt is that? That's a big pain in the butt. So what we do is we have put, we got these artificial pieces of paper that, that we have universal currency is where we're going to where, where we have said, well, basically we think a fifth of liquor and a 12 ounce steak are of equal value. So what we're gonna say is that fifth of liquor, $12, that 12 ounce steak, $12. So we've said, use these little pieces of paper. So I'm walking around with a piece of paper that says, this piece of paper is worth a fifth of liquor, or this piece of paper is worth a 12 ounce steak, or this piece of paper is worth whatever the other thing was that we were looking for, right? <laughs> The taxes. Okay. Yeah. So that's what we're doing there. But instead of the, so, but what we've broken it down to is you know, you, 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 the value of a candy bar compared to the you know, candy bar ain't worth the same as a steak, right? So you wouldn't give up this steak's worth of can piece of paper to get a candy bar. No. So that's what we're doing with a dollar. So you ain't got to be sitting there. Well, well, I'm just gonna carry a steak with me. Allison's gonna be like, I'm gonna carry a steak with me everywhere I go in case I see something that I want. <laughs> Tyler's not gonna be, well, I'm gonna be hauling around a fifth of liquor everywhere I go in case I see something I want, and I'm gonna be tempted to pop that bottle open and next thing you know, it's new and you smash it, right? So, so what we do is we've turned it into something portable that we're using to set values to, to smooth over those exchanges. Ashley doesn't care what Barry wants. It's none of Ashley's business what Barry wants, but she's like, I'm giving you something in equal value. These pieces of paper with George Washington's picture on them, I'm giving you enough of those. That you can get stuff of equal value to what it is that you really want for doing my taxes. And then I don't need to know what it is. It could be a steak, it could be drugs, because he's actually Luke's friend, right? Whatever it happens to be, right? So we're using dollars and cents because it would be just such an utter pain in the butt if we were still trying to go with the barter system. That would just be the whole nightmare. What would y'all have to do? What would you have to do to get a car if you couldn't pay cash? Hoard steaks. <laughs> you'd have to go. You'd have to go find a bunch of cows or that kind of stuff and start dragging a bunch of dead cows over there. The whole cow. Yeah, yeah. It's just it'd be pretty sick and complex. Hey, we, we, we wouldn't be like having cars, having nice houses, that kind of stuff, unless we could do it ourselves, right? So the money is just a tool. But ultimately, in order to have the market transaction, it has to be a buyer and a seller. And the seller is the supply side of things. They're supplying the product. And the buyer is the demand side of things. They're buying the product. Not rocket science here, right? I finally got to the point I was only single tapping instead of double tapping, but it's just still. So, supply. This is slightly different from the definition you'll see in the textbook, but, and ignore the last half of it. Just grok me. It's the ability and willingness to produce. A good service at different price levels in a given time period. The ability and willingness to produce. That is supply. Whether you're doing it or not, you are potential suppliers, maybe. Let me ask you this. How many of you have a backyard? Everybody be tired. Oh, you be tired. Okay. Everybody, oh, Allison, you don't have a backyard? Allison's ignoring me. Okay, good. Amanda. Amanda. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, Allison's back there. I knew it began with an A. Give me a problem. Okay. Uh, Amanda, do you have a backyard? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So everybody in here has a backyard. How many of you have a garden hose? All of you. Except Lestar. Okay. She's like, my kid's done, done something with the garden hose and the neighbor's dog and I don't even want to go in there. And how many of you can spit? Okay. Add something in your mouth and spit. Okay, congratulations. You all have the ability to become watermelon suppliers. You all can grow watermelons. You all right now can go into the watermelon business because you've got what you need. Spit seeds out. You, eat, you get the first watermelon, you eat, spit seeds out. There you go. I think I did a machine plant seed with seawater. But where's the fun in that? <laughs> I mean, I got a job in literally spit, and I ain't a tobacco taster. Score! You know, or professor wrestler. Right? You know. Or, uh, or uh, what's the snake? The cobra. Cobra, yes. There we go. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, you all have the ability to go into the watermelon business. Why are you not? How many of you are growing watermelons and selling them inside of the road? Every last one of you could, but you're not, because you at this point aren't willing to do it. But why? Well, because the price of watermelons is well, like I don't know, four or five dollars a piece. I don't think so. How many of you, if you found out that you could actually make twenty dollars a piece selling watermelons, how many of you would start growing watermelons to sell them now? Half of you. Okay. How many of you would start growing if you could find out tomorrow that you could make a hundred dollars a piece growing watermelons? Yeah, even the star who doesn't have a hose, if at hundred dollars a piece, she could afford to go to the store and buy a hose, right? Even she got to do it on payments, right? She'd do do that, or it might be worth the risk for her to go steal her neighbor's hose, right? She would, she do what she needs to do to make it happen, right? Sam is allergic to dirt, but he still would figure out a way to make it happen. Right? He'd be putting on, he could afford to buy the rubber gloves and that guy, he'd be making a hell. Okay, and okay, Amanda does have a backyard, Allison doesn't have a backyard, but she'd be figuring out something, she'd be throwing dirt on a neighbor's back, the garage roof, right? Those are seats up there, hey, even if only one watermelon grows, that's a hundred bucks, right? So y'all have the ability, but at this point the price is low enough that y'all aren't willing, because y'all are willing if the price got high enough. So you all are potential watermelon suppliers. Yes, that's where you end up having to come up with a balance that we'll be getting to slightly later. Okay, uh, let me get a name. I think I've talked to Preston. I haven't really talked about you. Preston. He, he, he's got an issue. He doesn't have a backyard because he lives on the 35th story of the high rise apartment complex there in downtown Alberta. Y'all know the one, right? Yeah, so he's, he's living up there at the top. He doesn't have a backyard, so he doesn't have the ability to roam. But if the price of watermelons got up to $100 a piece, he's sitting there going, well, let's see, 100 watermelons, $100 per watermelon, and I could probably get, I don't know, like 50 watermelons for an acre. So that's $50,000, okay? The price of an acre of land is like uh, $2,000. Would you spend two to make 50? Great, yeah. So the price gets high enough that he's going to get the ability, right? What? It's around 2000 no, it's gonna be like farmland, just agricultural land, fifteen hundred to two hundred. Yeah. Someone sounds interested. <laughs> but okay, Sam, he's like really allergic to watermelons. I mean, to dirt. Well, to dirt in general. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I'm gonna come back to that one in a few minutes. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna come back to that one later. Help me remember the same as allergic to dirt because it's going to be Thursday. We're going to be talking about his dirt allergy. But our supplies are willingness and ability to produce. But then it's like, how much are we going to produce in a given time period? How much are we going to make this year? How much are we going to make next year? How much are we going to make the year after that? Just depending on how much the price is that we're going to be able to get this year, that next year, that kind of stuff. Right? But our ability and willingness to produce, that is supply. I didn't touch it. Demand is our ability and willingness, in this case, to consume. To consume is to use it, to eat it, to burn it, 
to do whatever you want to do with it. Be the final end user of whatever the product is. You could consume a watermelon by eating it. You could consume a watermelon by sticking some firecrackers in it and blowing it up. You could consume a watermelon by cutting a little plug out of it, pulling it out, pouring some grain alcohol in there, putting the plug back in it, letting it sit overnight, and then you eat it or drink it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm getting a reaction here, but you know, <laughs> I'm going to Virginia Tech. Moving right along. Just, oh. <laughs> well, Lisa, hey, Lisa, the team won yesterday last night. Oh, just, you know. I, I retired my liver and stuff there on the wall of fame, shame, whatever. <laughs> uh, but our ability and willingness to consume, to use it, to eat it, burn it, whatever it is that we want to do. At different price levels at a given time period, same, same basic rules. If watermelons were selling for $100 a piece, forget, forget y'all growing it. If watermelons were selling for $100 a piece, how many of y'all be going to the store buying watermelons? None of you. If watermelons were selling for $20 a piece, how many of you would go to the store and buy watermelons? If five dollars a piece, how many of you go to store and buy watermelons? Well, that's about what you're selling for now. Have y'all been buying watermelons? We had them on sale for two ninety nine. Okay, they were on sale. How many of y'all bought the two ninety nine watermelon this past weekend? Well, I did because we ran out, and I got cussed out. So, as our price gets as the price gets low, our ability and our willingness to buy goes up. Price, you know, I ain't willing to spend hundred dollars on a watermelon. Something that I'm going to eat in a few minutes is gone. I don't think so. And especially, I don't have the ability to buy $100 watermelons if I only have $35, right? But when the price gets below $35, I do have the ability to get a watermelon now, right? Assuming I have transportation to get there, right? Mm -hmm. So as the price gets lower, our ability to consume increases and our willingness to consume. Well, our willingness to consume is are we interested? If you're allergic to watermelons, like setting aside watermelons, peanut M and M's, love lean. Right, it's allergic to peanut M and M's. So would you pay hundred dollars for a pack of peanut M and M's? No, she could pay hundred dollars. She's gonna make her sick. Would you pay fifty dollars? Would you pay twenty dollars? Ten dollars? Five? Two? One? Fifty cents? A quarter? It don't matter what the price is. She ain't gonna buy them because they're gonna kill her, right? Her willingness is based on her interest. Is she interested in the product? She ain't willing to spend any money whatsoever on something that's going to make her sick, something that's going to kill her, right? Her ability, well, when evidence is selling for $100 a piece, maybe she ain't able to buy a bag, but when they're $20 a piece, she's got $20 in her wallet. Don't mug her in the parking lot. She's got $20 in her wallet. She's got the ability to buy them, and she still ain't willing to because they'll kill her, right? She ain't willing to spend money on something that's going to make her sick. Does that sound like you? Are any of y'all here willing to spend money on something that's going to make you sick? Okay, in a couple of years when y'all turn 21 years old and y'all get drinking a whole bunch and you end up drinking the beer that makes you sick, just remember, you paid for it, right? You just don't know where that line well, is, right? I'm not going to buy it to explosive get sick. Yes. So you just, I don't get people to buy it for you. So our demand is our willingness and ability to buy. Demand only exists if there is someone willing and able to buy the product. If there's nobody willing and able to buy the product, there is no demand for it. I have a new product. This is actually brand new this year. I have a little side business. I'm making Eagle Eyeball Soup. I go out, I find eagles, I pluck their eyeballs out of their skulls, and I make soup out of it. Anybody willing to buy it? Preston, yes. would you eat it? No. No. Okay, so I can sell them an empty can. Score. Okay. You going to? But people, is it, there is no demand for it. Let's just assume Preston aside, sick inside, because he's obviously not right. So just. <laughs> it's just or, like with the like, wildlife services. Yes. We're getting three weeks of the semester, and I'm really starting to fight, figure out who the troublemakers are. And Luke, apparently, you're off the hook. I think I know who my heroin user actually is, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay. But if nobody is going to buy any of my cans of Eagle Eyeball Soup, is there any reason for me whatsoever to go out there and start 
catching eagles and plucking their eyeballs out and going through the process of cooking it and putting in the herbs and spices and yeah. no there's no point in doing it because nobody's going to buy it but if Preston says yeah okay I can potentially sell a can so then I got to start looking at well how much is it going to cost me to make that one can and how much is it, you know, how much do I think I'm going to be able to get out of it to make that one can? What's the cost of making that can to get on it? Yeah, that's part of what you got to factor into it. That's part of the, a big part of the expense in your illegal drugs, Luke, is the, they have to factor in money to reward them for the risk that they take of the, I'm not just making money to pay, pay for the, my working tonight where I could be working at McDonald's making seven and a quarter an hour, but I need to make extra money to cover myself if I end up going to jail for six months. That's part of it's got to get baked in there. What are all of those costs to be produced? You got to think about them. But there is an opportunity cost whenever you purchase things. If Preston buys my can of Eagle eyeball soup, let's just assume he only has a dollar in his hand, in his pocket. If he buys the Eagle eyeball soup, he gave up the opportunity to buy peanut M&Ms. He bought the soup instead. He gave up the opportunity to buy that zero bar from the bottom of the machine because he bought this can of soup instead. He gave up the opportunity of taking that $1 sticking in the savings account and then coming back a year from now and having a dollar and one cent, right? He gave up the opportunity to take that dollar and buy a lottery ticket and then throw the losing ticket in the trash can two days later, right? Every purchase you make comes with an opportunity cost. Loveline buying the pack of peanut M&Ms. She, she took the opportunity to eat something that'll make her sick. She gave up the opportunity to eat M&Ms that wouldn't make her sick, right? So there is an opportunity cost for everything. So we have to be thinking about that when we're making our purchases, but the demand is only gonna exist if there's someone willing and able to buy the product. And that's your individual demand, and we put that together to get the total demand that we'll all talk about next time. Is the total demand for peanut M and M's, for eagle eyeball soup, whatever? The total demand is made up of all of the individuals. How many people in this classroom are willing and able to buy peanut M and M's? Expand that to how many people in the next classroom over, and the classroom the other way. How many people in this building are willing and able to buy peanut M&Ms? And how many people in the other building are willing to buy peanut M&Ms? That starts giving me the demand for peanut M&Ms for this campus. And that's gonna kind of give me the clue about, well, should I put peanut M&Ms in the snack machine? And how often am I gonna to have to come here to refill that snack machine, right? And apparently somebody thought there's enough demand for zero bars, that there is a zero bar in the bottom of that machine. Last I knew there was zero bars in that machine. I honestly don't know if they still are or not, but I dare one of you to go and eat one of those zero bars out of that machine. I got extra credit. Give me a buck. <laughs> give me a dollar to get it. I'm married. I can't give you a buck. I gave my last dollar to my wife yesterday and extra credit. I don't think so. It depends on how sick you get. <laughs> so. I'm give extra dollars. So any questions? Okay. Um, we'll stop there and we will pick up with this on Thursday. So drive safe and have a Merry Christmas. Uh -oh.